Hello and welcome to another special online event in which renowned music journalist and radio presenter Carl Lippergaus will interview pianist Lucian Ban and violist Matt Maneri in a live conversation part of the Isolation series. Matt Maneri and Lucian Ban first worked together in 2009 in the Anescu reimagined third stream extravaganza that celebrated the music of the great Romanian composer George Enescu featuring some of New York's finest downtown musicians, Ralph Alessi, Tony Malabai, John Heber, Gerard Cleaver, Albrecht Maurer, and Indian tabla legend Badal Roy, the album won several uh, Best Album of the Year awards for, from the Jazz Journalist Association. Their duet Transylvanian Concert has been released by ECM Records in 2013 and has won critical acclaim on bo both sides of the Atlantic including several Best Album of 2013 awards. In 2019, Matt Maneri released his Dust Quartet album featuring Lucian Ban to critical acclaim and reviews in Wall Street Journal, Just Times, Downbeat, and later that same year, they premiered their groundbreaking Deep Redux, rewriting of George Enescu's opera Deep. Transylvanian Folk Songs is their latest album made in collaboration with British musician John Sermon. Our first guest tonight is Lucian Ban, called a name to watch by The Guardian and one of the most gifted pianists to move to New York by Downtown Music Gallery. Lucian Ban is a Romanian-born New York-based pianist and composer known for his amalgamations of Transylvanian folk with improvisation, for his mining of 20th century European classical music with jazz and for his pursuit of a modern chamber jazz ideal. Lucian, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Our second guest is um, Matt Maneri. Over the course of a 25-year career, Matt Maneri has defined the voice of the viola and violin and jazz and improvised music. Born in Brooklyn in 1969, Maneri has established an international reputation as one of the most original and compelling artists of his generation, praised for his high degree of individualism, a distinctive marriage of jazz and microtonal music, and his work with 20th century icons of improvised music. Pianist Matt Sheep called him one of the five greatest improvisers on the planet, reflecting a growing consensus of Maneri as a central figure in American creative music. Since then, the long list of musicians with whom he has worked includes icons such as Cecil Taylor, Paul Blay, Paul Motion, and William Parker, as well as influential band leaders such as Joe Morris, Matthew Shipp, uh, Marilis Crispel, Joel Yander, Chris Davis, Tim Byrne, and Craig Taborn. Matt, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Our third guest, and the one who will ask the questions, is Karl Lippegaus, a renowned music journalist and radio presenter based in Köln, that has produced shows for WDR, Deutschlandfunk Radio, authored books and many articles, and interviewed some of the most important names in jazz for the past five decades. An editor for Phonoforum Music Magazine, Karl Lippegaus wrote a biography book on John Coltrane and worked on films receiving many awards for his work. Karl, thank you for joining us. Hello, Magda. Thanks for having me and hello to Lucian and Matt, of course. Um, we will start with a clip, which is actually the trailer of uh, the new album Transylvanian Folk Songs that was released last week on, on the 15th of May.
all for joining us. Carl, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Magda. It was very impressive to see this trailer and I showed it to quite a few friends of mine and uh, the reaction was overwhelming. Uh, people who had never heard uh, the music of Matt Maneri and Lucian Barnes said, I love this film and uh, what is this all about? It made me think of my first uh, violin lessons. Uh, my teacher asked me, what do you want to play? You know, you don't rehearse, what do you want to do? I said, I would love to play some Bartok. And I was 15 years old, I played uh, the 44 duos for violin with my teacher. And this was the highlight of my uh, violin lessons. So uh, Bartok was always on my mind, like it is for many jazz musicians. They all name Bartok. Uh, but for the composer himself, I think the field recordings that this album points at uh, were his life goal. And I would love to ask Lucian first, how did this project come about? Why did you choose the field recordings as your point of departure, Lucian? Uh, well, like a lot of, quite a few of my other projects, uh, they start sometimes with uh, uh, sort of commissioning and ideas from from producer who want to put together. So um, uh, in 2021, uh, one city in Romania won the award to being European capital of culture. That city, uh, there were a few cities that uh, were in competition for that. My hometown, Cluj, in the middle of Transylvania, was in the competition. It did not want, but uh, with them, I, uh, I approached the idea of doing a project related to the music of Bartok, specifically to the music, to the folk music that Bartok collected in Transylvania. Uh, the award actually went towards Timisoara, which is the western biggest city in Transylvania, close to the border with Hungary and uh, uh, former uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, uh, I was able to develop the project within the frame of this cultural capital of culture with a local organization, Just Updates, who I've worked before. They presented some of the projects uh, in the past four or five years. So, so that was the, the starting point. But uh, before that, the starting point was actually uh, the fact that, like you said, we all know, all of us jazz musicians and not only jazz musicians know about Bartok because of well because of its his sheer force and depth of of music that he created it's quite unique and it's it's for different reasons than Schoenberg or Stravinsky in the 20th century so and I was vaguely familiar with his work as a as a uh, uh, folk recordist like his ethnomusicology work and uh, when this project came about I started to discover what he actually did and his commitment his dedication and his passion for for the music of Romanian people it's unparalleled still to this day it's the biggest collection of Romanian folk music in Transylvania collected by one person the collection is bigger now in, in the you know folk institute uh, of musicology in Cluj or in Romania, but it was done by several other people over the past century. He, uh, he collected over 3,400 songs from uh, uh, I guess over 20 trips that he did between 1908 and 1917 uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So this was. What I've discovered was an, an immense body of work that it's extraordinary and his passion and love for, for the music here, he called it his life goal. And he, he kept annotating and working to, all the way to his last years of life, all the way to his last months of life in New York. Uh, maybe a question for Matt. Uh, how did you uh, hear about uh, Bartok? When was this? And what interested you in, in this composer? Well, as a violin student growing up, uh, I started when I was five and uh, Bartok was part of the regular repertoire. I mean, every violinist kind of got around to Bartok and those kind of melodies felt very at home to me, those kind of uh, 
kind of folk renditions and, and the rhythm, rhythmic excitement of it. You know, every violinist loves to play Bartok. It's, it's just a thing. Mm -hmm. So that was always um, a, a part of my classical upbringing life. Uh, but it wasn't until Lucian brought me these stacks of uh, transcriptions that Bartok did of these folk songs that I really got to know like how deeply involved he was in it. I didn't really realize that. Uh, and it was just an amazing resource to be able to go through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these folk tunes, each transcribed so meticulously and, and, and trying to capture the feel and, and hearing some of the field recordings were just mind blowing. And it really just got me juiced up to do this project. He was obviously thinking that uh, uh, this world that he was trying to capture was disappearing, right? That this uh, uh, agricultural world was disappearing. On the other hand, he was a true visionary in the sense that he said, um, it's no use to, to uh, have a puristic uh, attitude. It's no use to put artificial boundaries between the various uh, folk musics of the world, the more these things intermingle, the more these these things mix, uh, and the more uh, uh, one culture absorbs what comes from foreign cultures, the more uh, um, uh, the, uh, these things can, can con continue, the more uh, this, this music can continue to live. What is your opinion about this? Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I was talking about with Lucian uh, about this project was uh, how at home I felt with these melodies. And a large part of that is because my father, who was a first generation American who grew up in New York City, became a wedding musician. You had to work, you know. And back then you had to learn, you know, Hungarian this and that, and you needed to learn Spanish this and that, and you know, all these different cultures and folk melodies they had to learn for these weddings part of my life and it just felt very natural and growing mm -hmm. up in that kind of melting pot in New York City at that time it was just an amazing thing with all these tr traditions clashing and melding into each other uh, and that really informed a lot of what I do now. The album has very interesting liner notes by Steve Lake and I think you both know him very well. Uh, Steve not only is a, is a great writer, he's also a fabulous producer. He produced um, over a period of eight years, six albums with you and also with your father, who is one of the pioneers of microtonal jazz. And uh, Bartok said that his occupation with folk music uh, took him away from the, from the stiff major and minor system. He, he saw that there is a world in between all of that. And it's by uh, people who, who could not read, people who, who did not read news, who had not studied music. But he would, all, during all of his life, I think he was totally fascinated by um, uh, their art. Yes. Uh, and that's another thing. I mean, I think one of the reasons my father got into microtonal music in the first place was these folk melodies he was learning from around the world. A lot of it's bending the notes or playing somewhat different scales and that always fascinated him. And then he just used it more and more and then started researching it in a kind of more academic way, but also used it, you know, in, in, in his jazz playing. And uh, it just kind of came out of these folk melodies actually. Yeah. So what you're doing, uh, maybe this is also interesting for Lucian uh, as an observation, um, you're not imitating, you're not reproducing, you're not uh, uh, sticking close to the compositions, uh, but you're, you're sort of contemplating uh, on this world, you're, you're meditating on it, uh, you're uh, translating a feeling, uh, maybe the feeling of Bartok, who was actually interested in Franz Liszt and uh, Richard Strauss, and then stepped into this peasant's world, right? So what we hear is, is not a remake, it's a really new music, it's something new. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, there, was, there would really be no point of us trying to do a replica of the actual folk melodies. There are people, specialists there that actually do that, and they're wonderful and keeping the tradition alive. Well, what we wanted to do was really take the feeling of those melodies and improvise together coming from our different jazz backgrounds and what we like to do uh, to create yeah like you said that memory of it that very visceral feeling of, of these kind of notes that 
collide and, and jump off of each other, but also in a way that we could improvise in a jazz trio setting. I mean, it's an exciting way to do it. How was the collaboration with John Sermon? How did it feel for you? Well, I was first, oh, oh, go ahead, Lucian, sorry. Uh, well, first of all, uh, for me personally, and uh, maybe Matt will confirm, working with John was almost like a dream come true. I mean, he's of a different generation for, from us. And uh, he is rightly so one of the most uh, important European jazz musicians period for the past half of a century. I mean, he really uh, managed to do a, a, a synthesis of all that we love about jazz music and a, a sort of a European, in his case, British uh, sensibility in a truly original voice. On, on the other side, John worked with folk music. Several of his projects dealt with uh, British pastoral and folk music. Yeah. And uh, immediately when we thought who we would want Matt and I to, to uh, invite, uh, it was immediately, well, we would love to have John Sermon uh, because we thought his sound, his concept, his ability to understand so deeply folk music would be ideal for this. And he also plays three horns. So we had a, a very wide palette of sound and uh, uh, timbers, like from baritone saxophone, which is one of my favorite saxophones, uh, to bass clarinet, where he has such a unique voice on bass clarinet and uh, soprano saxophone. So, yeah. uh, working with John was amazing from this standpoint. And uh, when we got to Timisoara, where we had the chance to uh, spend nine days together, we did two workshops, two concerts, and basically we worked we we created in a way the music starting from these songs. Matt and I looked over. I don't, I don't know, a hundred pieces in, in Brooklyn from the collection and did some sketches, some ideas, but very, very little things. And then uh, most of it was developed in rehearsals and while we spent time in Tikmishwara. Uh, I've never met John by, uh, by up to that time. I know Matt uh, played with him at a jam session or at an ECM festival or something, but... Uh, we got to know each other in Timisoara and to, you know, create this music, music workshop, these songs, and just get to know each other. And we had, we had an amazing time. And uh, I think some, some of that great time we had also translated in the way the music came. But it was very loose. But uh, it was loose because we, all three of us, trusted the other ones. Oh, it is loose, but we also know what we're doing. I mean, it's... Uh, we allowed freedom because this is what we do. To, to I think be part it's also inter process. it's interesting that these uh, three instruments uh, don't really appear in uh, in folk music in Romanian folk music. Uh, the piano doesn't uh, exist in in this village music. The bass clarinet doesn't exist. Uh, the baritone saxophone doesn't, and the viola I don't know. But it brings the music to a different level. This dreamy quality, this contemplative quality that the music has uh, also comes because uh, these, these instruments are different voices from the voices that, that Bartok collected. So it becomes uh, sort of uh, palimpsest. You write over something else uh, musically. Uh, and maybe a good example for this is the piece of violent song because in this piece there's an, uh, a climax uh, that only jazz musicians can create. Uh, classical uh, musicians can't play like that and uh, on the other hand it's very connected to, um, to the feeling of traditional music and maybe we can hear this uh, short excerpt from an eight minute piece a uh, violent song. Perhaps you want to say something about this piece and then we hear it. So violent song is a piece that was arranged by Matt, but it already changed from the moment he came with your uh, suggestions to us, because I didn't do what he said. He told, there's a, there's a note on the, on the score 
uh, soprano and uh, viola play the melody in canon, piano, play something, think of thing Blay, th think of Paul Blay and have fun. So that's what <laughs> Matt wrote on the, that. I had no score basically, but I already changed that from rehearsal to, to, to the concert, which is the version you hear on the album, because if, if in the rehearsal I did some sort of a paddle and some sort of rolls on my left hand, in the, in the concert actually I worked a lot in the strings, I muted the strings with my hands, I played like a cymbal, which is a common instrument in the area. So this tells you how much we change things even from rehearsal to concert. We did yes. two concerts and the second concert I was in Bartok's uh, hometown, uh, like an hour away from Timishara, was also very different. Uh, it sounds very different. I mean, the basic uh, orchestration ideas are there, but with each concert, we play them differently. And this is actually the, for us, I think it's the beauty of the way of, it's the beauty of jazz, basically. Yeah. This, you can, do, you, you, you are, you have to put your stamp on it. It's different. And in this way, in this, we, we connect to folk musicians. But we are different than folk musicians. Jazz musicians are intellectual musicians, any way you want to put it, you know? So that, that was, uh, but it was Matt's arranging. And Matt, if you want to, uh, you probably remember better. Do you remember the tune? Yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> arrangement's a strong word to use. <laughs> there was an idea. But what, what's really great about, and that's why we actually put together this trio, working with people like John Sermon and working with you, Lucian. These, you, these are the top-notch improvisers of their generation, and I don't have to worry too much about the, the arrangement. is just to give a simple idea and throw it out there, and then we had time to develop it, and it kept changing and evolving. And That's the beauty of uh, having time to do something. That, that nine-day period was amazing to actually be able to build together all these personal ideas that came from each of us and then blend them. Uh, that's the beauty of improvisation, and the beauty of folk melody is that you can do that with. So maybe we can hear the middle part of this piece, a uh, violin song, Magda, do you have it right? <laughs>
Yes, the music uh, reflects the totality of Bartok's field recording experience, I think, because you can feel the seasons changing, you can feel the weather, the insects dancing, the houses, the country folks, their dresses, their dances, their movements, what they eat. And you also hear the silence from which the single voice emanates because Bartok heard one woman sing and this triggered off his whole interest in folk music. And of course, I thought of Jeannie Robertson and these great Scottish folk singers sitting in their cottage all alone, singing or playing a violin uh, to, to fight the loneliness and uh, the solitude. It's all in this music. And in, at the same time, it's music that is created out of the moment because what we heard there were only three people, but it sounded so orchestral. So again, congratulations to this masterpiece. Oh, thank you. Maybe masterpiece is uh, too strong of a word. <laughs> well, I use it. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Bartok calls, um, he talks about uh, uh, this relation between folk music and, and uh, uh, what, what it used to be called, and it's still called serious music. So he actually says, and it's a, a, it's a quote that we put on the, in the in the booklet, in actually in the artwork of CD, on the cover of the CD, an inside cover, where he says, I'm, I'm trying to quote from memory, he says that uh, the music, the peasant music, is de uh, developed uh, within a community. And uh, he says, all these small parts are masterpieces in themselves. And all these myriads of little folk songs, he says, even though they are short, the totality of them have the same depth and uh, of, of a masterpiece of a great proportion like a symphony. So Bartok was very, he was very uh, deep about how he sees folk music. And that's why he called, uh, for example, he called the pursuit of study of Romanian folk music his life's goal. That's yeah. his quote. Is yeah. to, 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 to finish and catch all, you know, to annotate and uh, because he published a uh, few uh, uh, collections during his lifetime. The first one was published in 1913 by the Romanian Academy and it was called uh, The Music of Romanian Peasants in the County of Bihar, which is in the western part. And then he published with his own money in Vienna, in Munich, 20, 1923 and 1935. There were problems, as you can remember. We all know there was the Second World War. There were a lot of geopolitical and, you know, historical issues there. And then the final work was published posthumously and it encompasses five volumes published in 1965, each one over 500 pages. And it's divided vocal music, instrumental music, carols and Christmas songs, and the music from Maramuresh, which is a very Nordic, area of Transylvania that has a very particular sound. And, uh, but, and Bartok said throughout uh, his uh, life, either in conferences or in notes that he wrote, he, he talks about how the music of Romanian folk, it's, uh, it's very different from the folk music of Hungarian or Slovakian or other people because he said it was very it was less affected by the migration and less affected by influences from outside. Or like what it's called, what he called back then, uh, the light music of the coffee shops in Budapest or Vienna, which, you know, a lot of gypsy musicians and we would play a music that was a, a cross between folk music and light classical music. And it was all, everything got very mixed up and be, uh, as opposed to the music of peasants from villages. So it's, um, it's a very deep thing that Bartok did. I'm, the more I learn about it for this project and the more I've read about his dedication and commitment, he learned Romanian. He transcribed himself each one of these 34, uh, almost 3,500 songs. His wife learned Romanian. So they, he, he kept lifelong friendships with, little, with uh, uh, teachers from little villages, with uh, priests from villages that where he traveled. The, actually, the first book is dedicated to, to Yuan Dushitia, who's uh, a professor in uh, 
in Beyush, which is a small uh, village in, in the Apusen Mountains in Transylvania. So it, it was a lifelong pursuit for him. We just scratched the surface. I think he was very aware of the fact that the, the, the so-called classical music world was not at all interested in folk music uh, and it hurted him and he kept on working. Even when he went to the United States into exile in the Second World War, he kept on working on these uh, collections and he, he studied and analyzed them and transcribed them and translated them at the Columbia University and he never gave up on this. And there's something else I wanted to talk about with you. Uh, it's almost like a metaphor. I don't want to glorify the peasant's world, but uh, uh, Bartok was very often very ill as a child and he was close to dying several times. He had pneumonia, he had bronchitis, he was always ill, but uh, for months when he was lying in bed he was thirsty for the world, right? And he went to Berlin and he went to Paris, he loved it. And then he went to these villages and then he went to America. That means uh, uh, he landed on, on, in Manhattan on, uh, in a noisy street. That's where his last years were spent. So it was like uh, having to leave paradise, having to go to a foreign world where nobody was interested in what he was searching for. It's a tragic life. It's a, it's, a, it's a short life too. It is. It is a short and tragic life, but if I can uh, insert something. A friend of mine pointed out to me that the photo I sent of him with Kodali and Johan Bushitia, this priest that helped him, there's a famous photo in a, in a forest near the village, was taken in 1918. So my friend pointed out to me in 1918, we had the Spanish flu. It was right then when he did all this research and it was we are now in the similar pandemic you with so much tragedy and pain and at the same time so much hope if you want to put it in uh, when 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 i knew that the labor sunnyside will release this according to schedule and uh, you know i wanted to just share a little uh, uh, about the fact that the album was released because i felt i felt weird to be honest to release the album because I just left New York for a couple of weeks. In New York, there's a tragedy ongoing by that uh, when I left at the end of March. And I thought about it, uh, well, isn't this a little presumptuous and to release an album of music, a CD in these times? And I thought about it and I didn't know what to, to say about it. And, but then immediately I was thinking about the songs and uh, what they embodied. It was the same enduring human feelings. It's pain, it's tragedy, it's love, and it's hope. And it's the same things that I saw on the, uh, in the eyes of the woman that are on the cover, which is a photo taken by Bartok in a small village in Arad County in the western Transylvania. It's the same things I saw in her eyes. If you look at the cover, if you look closer, it's, it, they're so, the, her look is so profound. And it's, it's, these are enduring human feelings. And uh, a lot of those we could hear, Matt and I and John, when we were hearing the, the wax cylinder recordings. Everything was recorded on the Edison wax cylinders. Mm -hmm. And you could feel the same pain or the bitterness. We have a song on the album, it's called Bitter Love Song. You, you, you hear the bitterness of, of the lover that lost the love or got dumped. I, I don't know what, what exactly happened. But you can feel the, the pain when somebody dies or the joy when, you know, it's, these things are the same. And it, it was very uncanny that this happened exactly a hundred years ago during the pandemic. It was, I, I didn't thought about it. It's a good friend of mine from Eucharist told me uh, about this. And uh, then I looked at that photo and then realized, so some of these things are the same throughout centuries. And I think this is the force and power of this, of folk music. It, it contains in itself, and all these things and it's very deep and uh, that's why a lot of uh, musicians either jazz musicians or composer are so much influenced by it because it's a source of creativity and it's a source of hope so uh, i'm i'm looking at the album different now than i looked before yeah 
Uh, you made uh, two remarkable albums last year. One was dedicated to Jimmy Jufra and his Freefall uh, record, very abstract kind of improvised music. And uh, you also worked a lot with Alex Harding. You've been living in uh, the United States for 20 years now. And you told me that when you prepared for the Bartok uh, project, you walked around in Brooklyn with headphones at night. Can you describe a little bit what you experienced, how you heard this music in, in this totally different urban context in Brooklyn? Well, it was a, it was strange a little because uh, although I consider New York home, I'm not from there ultimately. My I I was born in Cluj, which is in the middle of Transylvania, and grew up in my uh, 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 with my uh, grandparents on, on the side of my mother in a small village, not far from where Bartok actually his trail of collecting in. Uh, uh, so it was strange in a way to work in Brooklyn and I had to work at night with headphones uh, as to not uh, 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 bother uh, people. And, you know, this depth crosses, you know, crosses uh, uh, years and decades and it, it didn't matter that I was in Brooklyn. Of course, I was aware that I'm Brooklyn. Of course, I, I was aware I was walking towards Matt's place to try to work on this. And at the same time, we worked on an ESCO on the opera. And uh, it's... It's a very complex feeling for me, uh, you know, being from Romania but living in in New York. It's uh, it's it's unique. It's very you could we can do three sessions only talking about this. But uh, uh, I think in the end, what matters is that we move forward and we bring some of these ideas to fruition. It's not very easy in the current world, even before the pandemic. So uh, I consider myself blessed in a way to be able to work with Matt and develop this musical partnership over almost a decade and so many releases. And also with, with the other people that you mentioned, with Alex Harding, who's a baritone saxophone himself, one of the yeah. greatest you know, baritone players of the past decades. Yeah. And I remember first see, seeing and hearing him live almost 20 years ago with Stan Rapp. So it's in a way I, I feel blessed for, for, for these chances to get to play and know these musicians and develop work with them, you know. And uh, uh, I hope I hope in in a way they feel the same. Shall we talk about we Inesco because this is also sure. a very big part of your work? And uh, I think one of the key words is in that title of the record, uh, reimagined. Reimagined is a very central term for your work, right? Uh, it, it's not about reproducing or imitating or doing a remake. It's really uh, to, to think about things in a new way. And, and uh, this record, Reimagined in UNESCO, was on so many critics' favorite uh, uh, record lists of the year. Uh, this, this was in 2009, right? And uh, yeah, uh, can you talk a little bit about this record? I'll just say a few things because I want to let Matt uh, to actually mm -hmm. give uh, yeah. his take on things. So uh, this is something again that I have not planned. When I moved to New York, I was and still am in a way. I, I was only concerned with what we call jazz. I, I wasn't interested in the music of my people at all. Uh, and uh, I was a hardcore jazz guy. I was, I had my own obsessions from Monk to Andrew Hill to Paul Blay and a few others and that's it. And then this commission came from Enescu Festival, which is a huge festival dedicated to Enescu, classical festival in, in Bucharest, starting in 1956. And they asked me to, can you do something with Enescu's music? I said, sure. Uh, and then I started inviting all these amazing musicians and then I had to learn about this music and Enescu like Bartok, like Stravinsky, these are highly complex 20th century composers. That's, it's not easy music at all. And then uh, on, on purpose, I didn't want to do Enescu's most famous works like Romanian Rhapsody, uh, 
I, I worked with, with things that spoke to me. And uh, again, I asked uh, uh, another musician, the ba great bass player, John Ebert, to reorchestrate some of the tunes. And that was the first project actually I worked with Matt. And uh, uh, aside from Matt, we had uh, on violin the great German violin player, Albrecht Maurer, who's based in Cologne. And then we had uh, John Abbott on bass and rearranging, and Tony Malaby on tenor saxophone, Ralph Alice on trumpet, Gerald Cleaver on drums, one of the greatest drummers, contemporary drummers. And uh, we invited Padal Roy, the uh, amazing Indian tabla player. And uh, we played with Miles Davis. On, on exactly, and, exactly, and a, a lot of other people. And uh, we wanted Badal just to bring the earthiness a little. I didn't want to conceive a brainy, intellectual only thing. So he brought us, it was also very, even the human presence, he was very, he changed the way an Escort Imagined acted. Uh, I only say one thing, on one of the scores of, on the third sonata, because we didn't have time to rehearse, I wrote as an introduction, viola and piano play duo up front. And that, we never rehearsed that, of course. And the uh, concert, which is the album, and as we imagined, we just start, Matt and I just start playing, and it felt so natural, so good, that immediately after both of us said, okay. we have to do something as a duo. And that's how, we, that's how, our, how our collaboration started. So, and it continued last year with us reworking Enescu's magnum work, uh, Oedipus Opera. But I want, I want to let Matt say about how we, Enescu and how we met and all of that. Okay, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, that's the first time I really got to work with Lucian. And um, as, as a violinist, I, I grew up playing the violin and then switched to viola much later. But, um, you know, the classical music thing always was part of my life. Uh, so when he said, yeah, we're going to do UNESCO Reimagined, I'm like, yeah, of course, why not? You know, <laughs> you know, it never seemed like a big deal to me that, you know, you take some classical ideas and, and reimagine them. And what I love about Lucian, what I think became clearly so clear to me was that it wasn't going to be some kind of fusion-y, you know, redux of UNESCO. It was going to be really from Lucian's heart and soul of how he interprets music. And he picks the improvisers that really bring themselves to the project that can take this material and not kind of do little, uh, you know, mimicking or this or that, but really bring their own spirit to the project. Um, so that's what I love about it. That's the, the same with the folk music and the same with the opera stuff we worked on. It's not about, uh, you know, replicating it or taking it and then putting a, a hip groove to it or something. It's really about bringing our own souls to it and really exploring it in a musical way that we could really, uh, just uh, put forth our real personalities. And I, I just love that. Great. Shall we hear a little extract from the UNESCO records? Yes, I think we're going to hear uh, from the third sonata, uh, the way we did it on, on our album, the third sonata in the Romanian folk style. <laughs>
see that video footage Lucian. No? <laughs> no, that looks great. I think I think I've aged a little bit. Yes. <laughs> you look wise. You, yes. You have more wisdom though, Matt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this was uh, the first big Inesso project and uh, while you were working on Transylvanian folk songs you also worked on uh, the uh, material of the only opera that Inesco wrote, uh, Oedipus, uh, after Sophocles. And uh, just as a footnote, he wrote it in uh, 1916 and 17 by hand and then sent it to Moscow because he was hoping that somebody would buy it. And then the manuscript got lost. And four years later, Inesco writes the same opera again by uh, by heart, by uh, he auswendig, like you say in German. Uh, you know, he, well, you know, he, he was it. he was a prodigy in that sense. You know what Ravel said about him when he was his professor in Paris at the end of the nineteenth century. He said this: If by some reason we would lose Bach violin scores forever, we are okay. And Esco knows them all by heart. <laughs> this is this is a real quote from Ravel. As, mm. So he was a prodigy in that way, uh, and as, mm. such an underrated uh, composer, but a monumental composer of 20th century. And Oedipus is considered one of the uh, most important operas of the 20th century, even though it's rarely played because of its difficulty and length. And uh, of course, Matt and I took on it because what can two jazz musicians from Brooklyn do? <laughs> Just put together a large group, expensive. And try to do an opera <laughs> so that's what we did last year before the pandemic if i can say like this before all this and uh it was quite an experience and it was an amazing experience we got the chance to work with some again some unique and amazing musicians we had on vocals uh, uh the great gen shu uh and uh he's extraordinary interpreting. he's wonderful he's yes. amazing and she she brings again this is what this is our modus operandi. She brings her, her own thing. We actually encourage her. We wanted we wanted her and Theo Theo Blackman, uh, one of the premier uh, singers of of, of uh, modern jazz, to bring their own thing. And one of the first things we said, and actually one of the first things they told us, said we cannot sing operatic. I said we don't want you to sing operatic. We want you to to take the melodic line which Matt and I re. Uh, pulled out of the orchestration and do make them your own and then improvise. So, um, uh, and again, we had Ralph Alessi, who was just such an amazing and one of the, such a singular voice and consummate uh, trumpet player of, of, of modern jazz. And then we had the great French, the virtuoso on clarinet, Louis Clavis, first time we worked with him. And uh, we had John Ebert on bass and we had Tom Rainey uh, on drums. So, so it was quite an experience. We did a whole tour last year and it was recorded uh, uh, live in Amsterdam and we hope to release it if the world exists after this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, shall we hear a last track from Transylvanian folk songs just to finish this very nice conversation with you two? Uh, because I think our time is running out uh, slowly. Well, we still have a little time. We, we still have a little time if you... If, what would uh, you like to talk about, Lucian? I don't know. If you're, you're the interviewer, if you have any questions for, for, for the album uh, and how it came, came about. Well, I think that uh, the whole album, really, uh, it's not only the music, although the music is the main thing, but it's also the, the text, it's the photos that were taken by Bartok, it's the whole assemblage, it's, it's a whole piece of art in itself. And I would just love uh, people to discover this and to, to find a way to, to uh, a point of entry into this whole subject, into this world that we talked about, the rehabilitation of folk music on the Balkans. 
it's it, you use the word rehabilitation, but I think it makes us anew. If if we go back and take these things and reimagine them, I think we we gain things, and that music informs our search and our process and what we do. And I think it, it this goes across arts. And uh, the only thing I want to say is that the photographs that uh, uh, we have in the bo booklet uh, were taken by Bartok in 1917 in, uh, in the village of Savarshini Narad. And there are like 20 photos and not all of them can be used because of the underexposure. And uh, I just want to uh, deeply thank the uh, Bartok uh, archives in Budapest that uh, uh, they allow the courtesy for us to use those photographs because they, they were not published and uh, it, they're very rare. And as you can see, Bartok and as people that would get the album and even if you buy it digitally, you get the artwork. So you get as a PDF, you get the artwork, even people buy it. But as people would get the album and read the amazing liner notes, the great liner notes from Steve Lake, uh, we'll, we'll have the chance to see the photographs and actually discover what a great photograph of Bartok I mean, it's a, the photographs are amazing in, in themselves. I, I only say this, that um, it was a tremendous experience for me to work with John and Matt. It was like, everything went so smooth. It, it, was, it was very clear, as opposed in a way to working on the opera, which was much more difficult. Because the music was much more complex and it was much more defined. But working with John and Matt in these nine days and then just get to do this, this works and play them two times live and rehearsals and just, we didn't have pressure, which is so rare for us jazz musicians. Usually you're on the road constantly. You never get a chance to rehearse enough. We, with, with John, we, it was amazing that we had a chance to meet like for a couple hours in the morning, then go show him Kimishwara, the city, and then we'll just meet in the afternoon for a little and tried new stuff and he would bring, oh, what if I take this on bass clarinet, the melody? What if you don't do play the melody? What if, it was, it was just, it was an amazing chance. And I think it comes to the music. Absolutely. So uh, it's, uh, I want to thank, I'm not going to name them all the people that made this possible. And I want to thank Steve Lake for putting in context he understood so well the music. <laughs> Even, I was surprised, you know, I mean, not surprised, I was, I was surprised of things that I didn't tell him at all. When he sent the liner notes, I was, oh, did I say, I didn't tell this to Steve, but Steve has such a deep understanding of, and he knows Matt's work so well. So uh, I'm just grateful for these people that were present, the people in Timishwara, to the, Matt and John, uh, and you know, to be able to do these projects. And we hope we can get to play it again live. I think um, uh, the, the last piece uh, we want to play is Transylvanian Dance. Um, the music really gives out a message of hope here, a reminder of the richness and vitality of this music, its potential to uplift us. And Matt plays pizzicato here and the viola, viola sounds like a cello to me almost. Then a theme explodes and uh, there is uh, some Andalusian feeling in, uh, in this. So well, it's very interesting. The worlds are connected. If, if, if I just can say one thing, I arranged this tune and I wrote uh, some nice chords and then John came in and we were playing with the pedals and said, and John said, why don't you drop these chords? Don't play them. Just play the, no the, 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 the core of the pedal. So you see, it was, it was very communal in a way. And of course he was right, you know, because it, it allowed more space. So, so Matt and they can breathe. So, uh, I'm sorry, Matt, I know you wanted to say something before we, we end with this. Oh yeah, I just wanted to echo what you were talking about. First of all, Steve Lake, I wanted to really thank for those stellar liner notes because uh, I've been working with him for over 25 years now. Uh, he's gotten to be, know, know me so well. I remember our first project we did, you know, we'd fight about what tune should go here and ordering. And then many years later, one of the last records we did, we just wrote to each other, like, this is what it should be. And we had the exact same thing. <laughs> we just understood. Uh, having that kind of person know you for so many years is wonderful. And then finally, uh, John Sermon, Lucian Ban, you guys were great. It was one of the most magical weeks of my life. I fell in love with Timishwara. I just love that whole experience. Having a, I remember one of our lunches lasting about eight hours. <laughs> and that was because <laughs> of the wine. 
Yeah. Well, that was the, the one crazy day we had, but uh, it was just a magical, lovely experience to be able to like breathe life into these you know, beautiful melodies and uh, just to have fun with it and then really absorb it and then put forth something that really came from us as well. So thank you. It's all in the music, I think, and it's all to be discovered by the listener. I hope that we made people interested in, in the subject, uh, in this piece of art. And uh, I thank you all very, very much. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. And let's finish this off with uh, Transylvanian dance. Actually, all before, the best before to you playing, and take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, thank you for Before this. playing the last piece, I would like to, to thank you for a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Matt Maneri. Thank you, Lucian Van. Thank you, Carl, for um, actually uh, managing to, to do this um, interview. We are so uh, privileged and honored to have all three of you here. And, and uh, we I want to thank you, Matt. I want to thank you, Matt, that, uh, to you and Romanian Culture Institute in London for uh, allowing the opportunity for us to do this. And maybe, Magda, you want to say that Thursday we are doing another session which is way different. Maybe you want to do a short announcement. Thursday afternoon, uh, 4 p.m. UK time, we will have guests from all over the world, uh, the director of the London Jazz Festival, um, the programming jazz director for, for uh, Opera Lyon. Uh, we're still waiting for a few other confirmations to see how the pandemic has um, uh, influenced uh, jazz festivals and institutions all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you, and we will play Transylvanian dance now. <laughs>